I am Andrea Davis, Academic Convener of Congress 2023. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and York University, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first Big Thinking event at the 92nd Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences. The title of the panel today is Thinking Across Differences, Decolonial, Anti-Racism, and Feminist Perspectives. Today, Joyce Green, Rinaldo Walcott, and Gina Starblanket will reflect on the theme, the terms of change, drawing on their work in decolonial and anti-racism scholarship and indigenous feminisms. They will be joined in discussion by moderator and colleague, my colleague, Christina Shar. Today's event will take place in English and American Sign Language. We have also included French, simultaneous interpretation, and closed captioning in English and French. An ASL interpreter and closed captioning will appear on the screen on stage and on the Zoom screen for those of you joining us virtually. To access simultaneous interpretation, you will need to download the Sennheiser Mobile Connect application on your device, open the application, and click on the blue QR code at the top of the screen. If you're in the audience and you need um, translation from English to French and you need some help, you can raise your hand and we have a few um, people who can come over and assist you. You'll need to, like I say, scan the code. There's one just outside the room or someone will help you select um, French or your preferred language and listen um, using your own earpiece or I think you can also just put the phone to your ear. For those joining us virtually, you can click on the closed captioning button to enable captions. To use simultaneous interpretation on Zoom, click on the interpretation button and select the language you would like to listen in. I begin this afternoon by marking the violent histories of where we are, making note of and reminding ourselves of the ongoing conflicts and contradictions of this land, this water, this air. This acknowledgement is particular to Toronto, so for those of you joining virtually, please take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York's campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tiguranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon, Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Tikaranto's intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous peoples from other territories, as well as white settlers and those people who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. As a descendant of Africans enslaved in the Americas who were taken from their ancestral lands against their will, I am committed to what Tiffany King calls a notion of mutual care. And I recognize that a future for black peoples is not possible without a future for indigenous peoples by whose leave I live, walk on, and share this land. I acknowledge finally that these Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us when we enter any room, any virtual space, and we must always bring them into view. It is with this knowledge of history that we enter here this afternoon in the hope 
of making a different world. The Big Thinking series at Congress brings together scholars and public figures and artists to address some of the most pressing questions of our time. For Congress 2023, the series amplifies the theme of reckonings and reimaginings with conversations that honor black and indigenous knowledges and cultures and center diverse voices and perspectives. You can participate in the conversation on social media using the hashtag Congress, which is Congress with an H at the end. On behalf of the Federation and York University, I thank the series sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the Canada Foundation for Innovation and Universities Canada, as well as participating sponsor Sage Publishing for supporting this event. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Please welcome Dr. Rhonda McEwen, Professor in the Faculty of Information and President and Vice Chancellor of Victoria University at the University of Toronto, who will introduce today's lecture on behalf of the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Merci, miigwech. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. What a beautiful room this is. I, I, I was sitting there reflecting on the last time I was here, which was only a few weeks ago, um, at, the inst at the new inst the installation of the new chancellor for York University. Um, but I love this room. It's a really spectacular room. I want to just uh, say how much of a pleasure it is today to be here on behalf of the Canada Foundation for Innovation to introduce today's big thinking lecture. The CFI has the specific mandate to equip researchers in every discipline with the tools and facilities they need to be at the ready to pursue ambitious ideas, to respond to emerging and sometimes urgent social and economic needs when they arise, and also to seize opportunities to create meaningful insights and solutions for Canadian society. Congress provides an important forum for us to discuss those big ideas that help advance our understanding of the evolving and complex issues that shape the culturally rich and diverse world that we live in. So congratulations to York University for their expert hosting of this key event for Canadian research and to the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences for organizing yet another superb event. This panel perfectly reflects Congress's theme this year of reckonings and reimaginings as we explore ways to honor our differences by reimagining our relationships with one another. Can those relationships be non-hierarchical? Can they be grounded in decolonial thinking, anti-racism, and feminism? Asking these questions forces a, a reckoning with how we live together today and how we have in the past, and also how we can imagine a radically different world for a better tomorrow. To quote Arundhati Roy, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Today's Big Thinking Lecture will feature a discussion by an interdisciplinary panel of scholars, including Dr. Joyce Green, who is Professor Emerita with the Department of Politics and International Studies in the University of Regina. Dr. Green's work, and many of us are familiar with this work, has dealt with indigenous state relations, indigenous feminism, citizenship, identity, and racism in Canada's political culture, indigenous human rights and reconciliation in settler state context in Canada. Most recently, she has turned to research relating to Ketunaha Ka, Nation Matters, including its contemporary constitution and its cultural and political problematics since colonization. 
Dr. Gina Starblanket is an Associate Professor in Indigenous Governance at the University of Victoria. Dr. Starblanket is the Principal Investigator of the Prairie Indigenous Relationality Network, and her research takes up questions of Indigenous settler political relations in Canada, the politics of treaty implementation, Prairie Indigenous life, gender, and Indigenous feminism. Dr. Ronaldo Walcott is professor and sh You're like, shh. We love technology, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Ronaldo Walcott is professor and chair in the Department of Africana and American Studies at the University of Buffalo. I was trying to slow that down to make it. <laughs> All right, Dr. Walcott, who's a friend of mine as well, his research focuses on the cultural expression of black life with an interest in the transnational, diasporic, and national cross-currents of black creativities. Moderating this discussion will be Dr. Christina Sharp, professor and Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Black Studies and Humanities here at York University. She's also a Senior Research Associate at the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg, and the author of many books, including her most recent, Ordinary Notes, which was just published in April. Thank you very much for attending today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Green, Dr. Starblanket, Dr. Walcott, and Dr. Sharp to the stage. I guess I'm up. I can't see when I read without my glasses, and I can't see when I walk if I wear them, so <laughs> bear with me. This is the way it is now. I'm so pleased to be here, and thank you for those introductory and powerful remarks. And I'm so pleased to be here in the company of these incredible colleagues. Who got Joyce Green? Who Ninik Tunaka, English Cree Scots Metis? Who Gaki Kahi, Yakat Aknukliet? So I have told you in Tunaka who I am and where I come from. And I am going to emphasize for you that when I tell you who Ninik Tunaka, English, Cree, Scots, half-breed. I'm all of these things. And so I have a particular perspective on the complexity of identity. I cannot speak to envisioning a world of non-hierarchical relationships. I live in a present that is structured by the oppressions of both the past and the present. I live in a political, economic, social, and cultural milieu that denies my past and that of others like me in favor of a sanitized history redolent of white supremacy and settler triumphalism. The brutal facts of colonization have damaged indigenous peoples, territories, and cultures irreparably in some cases. The assumptions, interests, cosmologies, institutional structures and practices of the settler state have encoded erasures of indigenous peoples and legitimations of colonization of the state and its privileged populations. None of this has changed from first contact to today. So I am not optimistic about those non-hierarchical relationships. Colonization and imperialism generated human rights abuses across the globe and on Turtle Island. These processes must be understood in their connection, in their relationships, and in their impacts on both damage and privilege. I invite you all to situate yourself in those 
in those designations. The racialization of people that sustains these processes must be comprehended as well. Indigenous people share solidarity with others, differently positioned, but also struggling against trauma and a vile history. Together we plan for futures of recovery, remembrance, resurgence, and restitution. I will not speak further of reconciliation, which is unlikely given the lack of truth-telling, remorse, and restitution that must precede it. Thanks to the priorities, the presumptions, and the practices of the settler state and its corporate class, all of our futures are made questionable by anthropogenic environmental and climate collapse and by the addiction of our politics and our societies to the matters that fuel the processes that are going to eliminate us and all our relations. That is, as a species, we are destroying our world while ignoring the implacable calculus of Mother Nature. Our politicians are too craven and too implicated to be truth-tellers, to invite us to take the medicine necessary for healing these matters. Imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism thrive on the decimation of the natural order, the commoditization of lands, waters, and creatures, people, the privatization or state theft of indigenous lands. Those factors are taken for granted and are considered beneficial but not to us, indigenous people who are still culturally, physically, and spiritually land-based, even when some sell out by buying into the capitalist relationships at the expense of all our relations. To knock out relational perspectives, privilege responsibilities to the natural order and to all its denizens, to the land, to each other, to past and to future generations. For Tunaka, the principle of Akamas Kapi Kapsan, all living things, has always guided our relationships and directed our responsibilities. These values are inherent in our stories and in the Tunaka language, which I am only learning now. Yet our language is attenuated thanks to genocidal practices. Our stories sometimes die with our elders. We are deprived of our instructions in the form Tunaka have always been given them. We seek to restore our cultural corpus, our language, and our relationships with our territory and all living things. We seek good relations with others, too, where they will take up their responsibilities, but you know I don't give out blank checks. <laughs> Language matters. I did not think this was essential when I was younger. Now, as I struggle to learn Tanaka, I am gifted with glimpses into the great pedagogical and epistemic power of Tanaka teaching. I have learned how much I have to learn. It is my birthright of which I have been deprived. Our stories arise from our lands, our physical and metaphysical context. Much of those lands, too, are unavailable to us now, stolen in the legal alchemy that represents them as crown lands or private property. Indeed, in an intolerable irony, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled in Tanaka versus BC that while we have the charter right of religious freedom to believe what we want, we have no right to claim the territory that is essential for objects of our belief, in this case, the spirit Gatmuk. Read it and weep. The Supreme stripped Dunaka of recognition of the precondition for our sacred beliefs, stories, and responsibilities to the territory of Gatmuk the grizzly bear spirit. In that case, Tunaka were opposing the development of a year-round ski hill on the Jumbo Glacier located in the sacred territory. But it gets even more ironic than that because the BC government, which of course claims our territory as crown land, 
gave to Nukka back the responsibility for caretaking the territory, but they didn't give us the land back. And of course, they can change their minds at any opportunity. This is consistent with BC's approach to Indigenous territories. You might want to consider the ongoing Wet'suwet'en matter, a conflict between traditional caregivers of certain lands, TC Energy's coastal gas link, the COPs and the governments of both BC and Canada. But there are now too many similar ironies for us to laugh at these. Land recovery is essential for land-based peoples and cultures. Indigenous resurgence, commitments to being ourselves, to regaining our sovereignty and autonomy is a political preoccupation for some of us. We do not need to displace all settlers everywhere, although there is a need for some limitation, for respectful new relationships and for governance and taxation powers in the hands of Indigenous people. And there is a need for settler political support for Indigenous survivants to create a better way to care for our land, all land, water and creatures. It is not a capitalist vision, though. The process of language recovery, particularly when people are dispersed across distances and international borders, as Dunaka are, takes technology, linguistic and teaching capacity, elders' engagement, administration, time, talent, and money. The university should help, and here I make a pitch also to Rhonda. It owes us much, given its implication in the exercise of and legitimation of colonialism. This is particularly true in my discipline, political science, and in my field, Canadian politics. Scholars in universities could deploy their privilege in our service through research and fieldwork under our direction for our purposes. They could, with SHRC and other funding agencies, prioritize Indigenous knowledge and political research. They should take up their responsibilities to us, to all of our students, and to the enduring values that the Academy is putatively committed to. Indigenous people must recreate what we have lost in a contemporary context. We must remember what we can with the help of elders who are still with us. We must fill in the gaps of what we have lost. We must animate the instructions we still have while much is not available to us now. We must learn and use our languages and where that too is lost or attenuated, we must appropriate English and French as the great Emma LaRocque always says, make them our own use them authentically as who we are, and reframe the scaffolding of stories and histories that tell us who we are and where we have been. When I assert this, I do not mean that we will go into the past, but rather that we will take our values and our instructions, what we have left, as we invoke our guiding principles and others and set our steps into the path on, in our perpetual future as who we are, in our ancient homelands, in relation to all that has and still lives there and to the land itself. Taha. Thank you, uh, Joyce. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, okay. All right, so um, thank you, uh, uh, Joyce, for starting us off. Thank you um, for the warm opening from Andrea. Um, and I, as you mentioned, we've been asked to speak today about what our respective intellectual traditions might have to offer in terms of theorizing the conditions of possibility for change or the terms of change. Uh, and my intervention is going to focus on how processes of representation and knowledge claims can be either significant or limiting in those uh, efforts. So I'm going to start um, with a uh, commonly heard refrain. Um, throughout the, the popular literature um, in the social sciences, 
um, the concerns, the creation and govern governance of, uh, of Canada. Uh, dominant narratives tend to suggest that colonial settlement was negotiated and governed legally and fairly with indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. In approaching questions of settlement in the territories claimed by Canada, the British Empire was said to be of a liberal mindset uh, that purported to respect and cultivate universal ideas of human freedom and equality. Indigeneity has, uh, since this point, contributed to the maintenance of a series of national mythologies around the ways in which Canada came to be. And as the important work of Dr. Green has demonstrated, these cultural myths work together with partial historical narratives, manifesting within Canada's judicial and political institutions to consolidate, sustain, and extend imperial and colonial interests. But these representations are more than just mythologies or false narratives to be resisted, as they have enduring social and political implications that influence how we come to understand and engage with questions of identity and subjectivity in the present and how we conceptualize about the future as well. Discursively, black and indigenous populations are each situated marginally, albeit differently, relative to the white settler nation. Indigenous people are selectively invoked um, insofar as we contribute to Canada's birth, its identity, and its evolving claims to constituting a peaceful, reconciling nation. Representations of black people in politics tend to be deployed to legitimate Canada's identity in different ways by bolstering its claims to equality, diversity, and inclusion then and now. And too often efforts to engage diverse subjectivities in the academy continue to be overdetermined by Western frames and approaches that lead to highly circumscribed understandings of the full range of complexity, complexity that exists among us, as the notion of what Indigenous and or Black people really want or stand for socially and politically uh, continue to be represented all too often relative to whiteness and the settler state. Western thought has been blind to the violences inherent in its own claims to universality, which can eclipse the significance of context, minimize the importance of difference, and of diverse political positions and experiences. So queries into subjectivity, um, for me, be, as they relate to um, Indigenous identity and what our sort of uh, individual and collective political horizons um, involve, must begin with the recognition that colonial violence has deeply impacted um, our ability to live freely in relation to creation. From here, we see significant impacts upon our own processes of subjectivity formation, but also our in intersubjective ability and capacity to be in relation to one another. This is something we've lost sight of, this capacity um, and perspective of understanding the self in relation to the worlds we inhabit um, as they become shaped by discursive formations within and outside of our communities, uh, which serve legitimatizing or constraining functions. So scholars such as Glenn Coulthard have problematized how indigenous political identities and strategies have been influenced by the colonial context and how in many ways our attempts to navigate these cores of an extractive relations have served to reproduce processes of domination and equality at a structural level, but also how they continue to shape our subjectivities in the process. Of course, it's not just the broader colonial context. There's very material sort of instruments, um, policy instruments that have been enacted beyond that theft of land uh, and the impacts on our ability to relate to one another across difference. Uh, the exercise of state power in Canada has also been deeply racialized and sexist. Specifically, the Indian Act has come to discursively shape, regulate, and govern how many of us have come, how many of us have come to think about Indigenous identity at individual and collective levels. Indeed, much of the origin of Indigenous feminist activism in Canada um, has involved resistance to the historical and ongoing dispossession of thousands of Indigenous women and their offspring through the Indian Act's outmarriage clause. So Indigenous feminists have critiqued the ways in which processes of state recognition are deeply gendered and anti-relational, arguing for anti-violence strategies and a return to more relational modes of being within and between our communities. They've also problematized the gender, gender nature, and here I'm thinking of the important work of Emma LaRock, um, who's challenged the gendered nature of collective articulations of identity, particularly when grounded in culturalist terms, pointing to the ways in which specific practices of cultural identification, such as essentialist dis descriptions of indigenous women as life givers and keepers of culture, can serve a narrowing function by placing parameters around potential ways of being indigenous, 
in a contemporary context. And here I'm also thinking of Eve Tuck's important work on complex personhood and desire, where she urges communities to suspend totalitizing categorizations of difference by looking beyond the damage wrought by colonialism and towards the notion of desire as a way of understanding our political communities. And this is a way that can overcome sort of a flattening or binary or dichotomous uh, um, uh, representations of identity. Desire, Tuck says, is an assemblage of experiences, ideas, and ideologies, both subversive and dominant, which necessarily complicates our understanding of human agency, complicity, and resistance. <clears throat> it allows for a look at the whole person rather than having to extract part of, part of um, a person that might fit within a particular politic, uh, including the many influences, source of sources of knowledge, responsibilities, and relations that constitute them. As Tuck writes, this is what accounts for the multiplicity, complexity, and contradiction of desire, how desire reaches for contrasting realities even simultaneously. The question of who we are then uh, and what we stand for should always be accompanied by the important consideration of what we want our communities to be. That question, I think, is a, is a very crucial one. It can help map out aspirations and multiple complex political postures uh, and also their potential contradictions. Now, in talking about undoing and openness um, and a willingness to sort of lean into desire as a political uh, frame, I'm not advocating here for a blurring of distinctiveness that amounts to a universal politic, as this would work to cleave off the particular qualities of our, our respective orbits of political thought and possibility. Rather, charting out the zones of possibility for Indigenous and Black relationalities, um, it, it means more than just mapping out um, respective compartments of political critique and horizon. It means a willingness um, uh, and an openness to deep critical inquiry into our own political identities and orientations around the future. For Indigenous people, it means recognizing the importance of our territorial and identita identitarian nature of our claims and critiques, while also making the space for interrogation of the normativity and exclusions with which indigeneity, land, and groundedness can become represented in our works. And in this, I'm thinking of Billy Ray Belcour's forthcoming work on queer desire as decolonization, where he situates queer indigenous theory as a method by which we might enact the imaginative power to destabilize the ontological stability of the present. Here, Belcour offers insights into the ways that indigenous queer scholars are sculpting new discursive territory from which to insist another world is possible. Troubling normative conceptions of gender and normative conceptions of indigeneity, along with the coloniality of normative conceptions of the self and the heteropatriarchy of social form, he, sit he situates a world unmoored from these as a decolonial world. Love, he reminds us, is to, feel, is to feel and be pulled by that which we want to come. It can help situate us within a politic of the future that is refigurative in that it orients us not just an, towards an abstract future, but it can orient how we act in the present. So by leaning into new approaches and understandings of love, kinship, and relationality, we might, we might have the potential to move beyond an understanding of our political project here I'm speaking for Indigenous people as the reproduction of Indigenous bodies, essentialist identity constructions, and away from narrow understandings of groundedness. It can allow us to reflect on the various diverse ways we are driven out of the world, but also the ways in which we can work together to find new life worlds. So these are just a few of some of the interventions that are working to broaden the spaces where the political spaces where indigeneity can be understood to thrive, but also where it can coalesce across difference um, uh, in allyship um, in generative ways. And these ways of thinking and being in active defiance of the ontologies that are imposed upon indigenous people are, in my view, where some of the really interesting and potentially most transformative um, coalitional possibilities lie. These path pathways are allowing us to think about politics in more nuanced uh, fashions. They're allowing us to reckon with the ways that questions involving identity remain very real, but also spill past established categories of form and critique. 
Rigid identitarian categories can pose a real threat to relational modes of political thought as they can reinforce essentialist articulations of who we are rather than who we aspire to be. So desire can point us to an analytic, an ethos, and a politic that we can consciously assu assume and create space to talk about why we're assuming that position. Now, none of these pathways, none of these sorts of um, ideas I'm pu putting forward uh, or drawing on are straightforward, right? They might intersect, be adjacent, overlap, or diverge in significant ways. Um, but this brings to mind uh, Leanne Simpson and Robin Maynard's important work uh, in Rehearsals for Living, where they talk about undertaking relationship building in ways that aren't prefigured by whiteness or in relation to the state. They talk about perhaps we need a new language of relationality here. Um, and their, their work is oriented towards honoring shared interests uh, in securing black and indigenous futures. And I think that aim, that sort of horizon, um, again, really prefigures what the mode of engagement is. So engaging the interrelated dimensions of black and indigenous feminism and freedom for them does not mean, for them, does not mean abandoning localized contexts and knowledges, but instead they provide one a model of engaging black futurity within Anishinaabe epistemologies. It's crucial, I think, in seeking to explore the spaces where we might move uh, relative to one another that we don't merely extract and tag on distinct experiences and knowledge, knowledge bases to, to modes of analysis that haven't been informed by these perspectives, because that can also be incredibly damaging. Uh, we need to understand the complex and diverse nature of our theorizations and modes of engagement, acknowledging the tools and analytics that our movements have made possible through a contextuality based in relations with place rather than a move to universality. And so just to reiterate, um, thinking about the terms of change for me begins with the willingness to be self-reflexive about our own movements and how we're conceptualizing and representing them so that we do not engage narrow, reductive frames in how we understand ourselves and one another. Uh, the question of what our respective political stances, visions, and critiques, critiques entail requires us not just to map out their content, but also to reflect on how we think about and come to understand and know them. It means a willingness to contend with the complexity of political identity, including how different subjects within our respective movements are represented and constructed. From here, we're better situated to reflect on how we might move in relation to one another and to make sense of and action areas of convergence with other social politi and political actors and collectives. And so I think as the bodies of work on relational approaches, both in black and indigenous intellectual traditions become more developed in practice, we all have the responsibility to think about the conditions that enable the inhabitants of diverse locales to move from subjects within re the relation to active agents. And so broadly conceptualize uh, potential ways of working towards change within uh, terms that are truly co-constituted. Thanks. Hello, um, I would like to thank the Congress and especially Dr. Andrea Davis for inviting me into this conversation um, with my colleagues here. The profound crisis of our moment is a crisis of meaning. If you leave here hearing me say one thing today, please let it be this. Even inside the university, the crisis of meaning is most acute. In the post-60s world, some ideas, desires, practices, practices even had meaning. The meanings were not always settled, but the, but the ideas accounted for something to which at least we could strive towards. In our present moment, our historic hall would say at this present conjuncture, old meanings, almost settled meanings, are not just under attack, but literally being remade in actual time. Florida and Texas are the most spectacular example of this conjuncture, or the German state on, the Pal on Palestinian liberation. The other side of the conjuncture is the induction of not white people as representatives of white supremacist arrangements, as if such representation is transformation and the making of a new world. The university remains one of the last few bastions where we can confront this remaking of meaning but it is not the only one. For those of us who have been subjected by the knowledges produced by and through European humanist knowledge creation, of which the modern university has been a central purveyor, 
We know that the university is the linchpin to modern violence. Says. In the university itself, meaning making has shifted skillfully and seductively to its own remaking of the meaning of what institutional transformations might look like, what freedom dreams can be, and how we might overthrow white supremacy once and for all, which is to say how we might, how we might put an end to the 500 plus years of white supremacist rule of the earth. Black indigenous and others not marked as white have now been inducted more fully into the maintenance, policing, and the distribution of the meager resources allotted to some of us to maintain the edifice and the manifold violences that sutures this, this society together and of which the university is a central player. To do this, the university has also had to apprehend meanings that were almost settled to do the work of obfuscation. Under the languages of indigenization, decolonization, inclusion, diversity, equity, and so on, languages which once threatened the university, their appropriation and remaining is now fully on the way in a university that looks no different from the meager gains garnered in the post-1968 moment. Despite all the rhetoric of contemporary transformation, the most significant remaking of the university happened post-68 and for a very brief moment, and nothing has matched it since. But if you were not paying attention, you would think that we are in a post-68 moment again. We are not. And therefore, it is imperative that we, that we are clear about the stakes of the struggles we are in. We must not concede the crucially important idea of, colon, of decolonization to the university as a plaything that continues to enable white supremacy under a pseudonym. Indeed, the people, culture, inclusion offices and their representative not white bodies, as in a few singular people, actually only exist because of the power and the threat of the idea of decolonization. And we cannot afford at this time to have individuals be willingly deployed to interrupt more radical collective demands for the making of a new, different, and dare I say, better world. Decolonization as foundational to the kind of freedom I want to articulate is an overthrow of the dominant and violent register of the singular account of a global being. In some recent scholarship, the debate concerning the poignancy of the anti-colonial versus the decolonial has positioned those as belonging to different conceptual and even geographical spaces and languages. And one is given primacy over the other as if such primacy legitimates correct processes for or towards decolonization. In my reading of both terms, they function as stages towards decolonization, which for me are the stages towards a possible freedom. The move from colonial to anti-colonial to decolonial represents the phases of how we might get free. As a process towards freedom, rather than different conceptions of freedom, I argue that anti-colonialism is one moment off phase of the freedom struggle in which the desire, to be, in which the desire outcome is a decolonial present and a decolonized future. Therefore, I write against the logic that, though, that these are all different and not a part of a continuum or phases that unfold onto and into each other, back onto and into each other. Indeed, a decolonial present and a decolonized future would be one in which your American humanism is not the central mechanism through which life is organized globally, and such a profound refusal would radically shift our relationship to what is now called nation and state or tethered together as the nation state, ordering how planetary life is organized. In the late stages of global postmodern culture, narratives of liberation have been reduced to the horizons of capital, sovereignty, self-determination, land, representative democracy. And these are all the post-Enlightenment ideas of European expansion and its imposition of how the globe should be ordered. If we are to approach something that we might imagine as freedom, we will have to risk saying what we will have to risk saying what that something is. Increasingly, for me, that something rests in refusing the post Enlightenment categories, the ones I just mentioned, and these ones: red, white, black, woman, queer, gay, and so on, that Euro-American modernism has bequeathed us. By this, I mean that even as the historical weight of those categories shape how we experience the world, we also know that, we also know that there is something beyond them, 
in, in fact, something beyond them that is in relation to them and even partially produced by them, but also exceeds them. And it's the sober reality of the hybrid nature of our experience that demands new forms of invention of sociality. These new inventions of sociality will take as their foundational structure and refusal the historical brutality of our encounters to fashion new modes of being together and thus to invent a new beingness. The earlier insistence that anti-colonial practices are in service of a decolonized present and a decolonized, uh, sorry, a decolonial present and a decolonized world, which is to restate a world without the practice of domination, points towards the freedom that is to come. But only if we can break the brutal and seductive hole that your American humanism has locked us into. Of course, history has intervened, as Stuart Hall has taught us so well. We must now carve out and invent a freedom that is unshackled from your American humanism, a freedom that emerges from the encounters of European expansion and one that exceeds its ideological formations. To do so means we will have to encounter each other within and against the world, the world-orienting forces of your American humanism. It is a task worth pursuing. The late Caribbean novelist, essayist, and activist George Lamin understood the task as one of invention. Writing of the Caribbean region, but I think his idea is bigger than the region, he theorizes what decolonization might be. And he states, and I give him the last word. So quote, and that is the most urgent task and the greatest intellectual challenge. How to control the burden of this history and incorporate into our collective sense and incorporate it, sorry, let me begin that again. And that is the most urgent task and the greatest intellectual challenge. How to control the burden of this history and incorporate it into our collective sense of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professors Green, Stark, and Walcott, um, for your remarks. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna um, I'm, be I'm gonna begin by by saying that each of you has offered us a really rich um, set of thoughts and provocations around the theme of reckonings and reimaginings, around their impediments. Um, their possibilities and impossibilities, and really the work that is to be done. So I want to open up our dialogue with an invitation, and it's a genuine invitation, though you don't have to take me up on it. It's, not, it's an invitation, not a requirement. And that's to, um, after listening with, to each other's remarks today, and I know that Professor Green and Star Blanket often um, collaborate, but um, after listening to each other's remarks today, is there anything that you'd like to ask your co-presenters to elaborate on? Is there something in particular that they said that resonated with or perhaps challenged what you're currently thinking about and how you're thinking about it? You know, I'm thinking about um, Professor Green talking about the kind of work of rest, the, un the unfinished or really deeply incomplete work of restitution. You know, the question of, um, you know, political arrangement and community and the question of meaning. So is there anything that you'd like to, um, to ask each other? <laughs> you know I've got questions, so, you know. <laughs> I enjoyed every word they uttered <laughs> and I found them immensely challenging and I will ask them no questions till I've had a chance to think more deeply. Okay. So you're throwing it back to me then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Except, um, would either of you like to? I'm, I'm uh, not coming up with anything immediately. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll step in. I'll step in. Um, and so then, um, let me try to decipher my notes um, <laughs> to say that, okay, so we, we need, I think, new vocabularies that give meaning 
to our social, uh, I think we need new social, political, and analytical categories that give meaning to our lives and work. What is a necessary word, phrase, or concept that's central to your individual and communal work? Um, the work of imagining otherwise. I mean, so I've heard restitution, responsibility, desire, refusal, um, relation, imagination, home, risk, story. And so what is a, if you were to choose one, what's the necessary word, concept, or phrase that you would highlight now? And what would you want this concept to animate and therefore make thinkable and doable? So I talked about situating things within our own context. And so for me, uh, treaty is an incredibly, enormously important context in terms of thinking about how to relate across difference, um, thinking about how to relate to uh, people we might not even speak the same language of, as, let alone have like immense cultural um, and uh, ideological sort of chasms. Uh, it, we used to have those resources as Indigenous people prior to uh, Canada and for me rebuilding uh, our own capacities to be able to um, organize and work well uh, in relation means being able to uh, reclaim and also create new you know practices of what that might mean right so treaty for me is something very localized that is an incredible source of inspiration for how to work across difference and think beyond those sorts of um, identity-related categories. Thank you. I, I think I would like to foreground Ronaldo's instruction, which I read in his work, and that was, in my preoccupation with land and history, we must not forget the distinction between those who were commodified, their bodies were commodified, for indigenous people, we weren't wanted, and so our land was taken. So we have a landless people brought here under force and exploited, and we have a, a people who had land and have been eviscerated from their land and their, their practices. And I think that there is much common terrain we have, despite that fundamentally different historical positioning, because the outcome now is we're here. <laughs> and we're staying, and we, we are planning a future in which we can honor all of our ancestors and in which we can claim all of our um, ancestral teachings, including those we have lost in some mechanism. And what Gina does always so powerfully is provides the theoretical apparatus that allows us to conceptualize these things. I can give you an account. She can give you the theoretical framing that can animate a political project. So in a sense, you know, it seems like you're building on the word treaty, not as a legalistic framework, but, but in, a, in a sense of how one, one negotiates space and being across historical and current differences within a space of, of relation. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me put a qualification on that. Mm -hmm. Do not do not have a treaty. And I point out that a great labor negotiator once told me, always negotiate from strength. Mm. Don't think we're in a good position to negotiate with the governments of BC and Canada. We don't need a treaty to know who we are and what is ours. So the political project then is how to compel Canada and BC to understand that they're the ones that need to make the concessions. Because every time we're taken to a treaty table, we are told that the governments will recognize certain insignificant rights in return for our agreeing that we're giving up everything else. Yeah? yeah. yeah. And that is not a treaty I want. Thank you. Uh, Ronaldo. Yeah. I'll pick two words. Please. <laughs> Invention and risk, they're the two words that are animating my comments today. And and I, I picked them for very particular kinds of reasons. I think that um, what post-enlightenment post -enlightenment, your American 
Humanism does is it offers us capitalism and the nation state mm -hmm. as the only avatars within the context of which we can invent and take risks. And part of my argument is that in terms of um, exceeding the logics of your American humanism, um, that we can indeed um, engage in new acts of invention. Mm -hmm. um, but to engage in those new acts of invention means that we must take some risks. It means we must take some risks in refusing sometimes the language of land because it's so deeply contaminated by your American um, ideological positions of what land is, sovereignty, all of these, all of the languages that we now use to try to make a stake inside um, the arrangements that your American humanism have offered us are deeply, um, they set a horizon and therefore they continually interrupt the possibility of the risk we need to take to invent new forms of social life. So um, what Gina and Joyce just said about how they work with treaty is exactly the place within which I see the interesting possibilities mm -hmm. um, for new forms of invention of social life and meaning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ronaldo, as, as at the end of your talk, and I, I got lost writing it down, you said something about hybrid inventions of sociality. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that correct? And that really made me think of things that, um, that both Joyce and Gina said, I think uh, Joyce in terms of, you began by talking about complexity of identity and that you know very well because you inhabit that complexity of identity. And then Gina, when you were, you were thinking with Eve Tuck and thinking about the question of desire, really is that which might allow one's complicated and entire self to enter into the kinds of commitments uh, and the work to be done. And so I, I think, I, it, it's not so much a question, but it's an invitation to keep thinking along, along these lines because I think without having read each other's remarks, you all touch on mm -hmm. a very similar thing about a kind of invention of sociality which um, puts identity under pressure and which I think speaks to the kinds of invention and risk that Ronaldo was also turning us to. So I just wonder if there's more that you all would like to say about that together. I mean, if, if I might briefly, part of what I was trying to get at by that, that phrase, kind of hybrid social practices, uh, is, is to kind of push against the kind of logics of singular identities, those logics of singular identity that your American humanism offers us. You're only black, you're only queer, you're only woman, you're only indigenous. And, and so, even in that logic, it breaks the fact that we have ongoing existing relations. Yeah. And so those logics don't allow us to often um, speak those into places like universities and its desire um, that I think complicates those narratives. And when our desires are on full display, then that, that entire edifice begins to crumble. Yeah, I think we've had to really kind of, for you know, um, indigenous um, political thought, I think, and practice, we've had to kind of really articulate these um, and construct and articulate these notions of identity that kind of are perhaps a means to an end, right? But desire kind of it can get us out of that and think through a fuller picture of what, what we want uh, our political projects to entail and look like. And um, it makes sense, you know, for, for many years we had to have this sort of kind of charting out of what we stand for um, in terms of um, this move, decolonial or resurgence movement or indigenous feminism, feminism's movement or whatever the case, right? The sort of definitional uh, phase, which inherently necessitates a bit of a sort of defensive posturing mm -hmm. um, and staking out of parameters. But once that space has been carved out, um, you know, there's still always a self-legitimation -legitima um, task and project. We're always going to have to legitimize our knowledge as credible. But we also can, I think, extend and maybe lower some of those boundaries and, and um, uh, parameters, boundaries around who we are, right? Uh, so that we can start to um, invite and open ourselves to relations of, um, I think, change, relations of transformation uh, that can happen across across those boundaries. 
I think I'm always reminded of the late, great Edward Said's observation that none of us is only one thing. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are fundamentally, as human beings, inclined towards hybridity of genetics, if not always of culture and politics. And I embrace that. I think it is important for us to remember that we have far more in common as human beings than we like to assume. Our political projects, though, may be distinctive depending on our historical and present cultural contexts. But we should find common cause as human beings to understand each other's contexts and to support each other and to come together in less essentialist ways than the colonial state has constructed for us, including in its constitutional designation of Indians, Inuit, and Métis, which leaves out a hell of a lot of indigenous people <laughs> mm -hmm. and purports to define one of them, Indians, through that utterly racist and colonial piece of legislation, the Indian Act. Mm -hmm. So we have many reasons to be very cautious about the state, which invites me always to point you towards who the state represents and who it is most closely allied with. And from the point of colonization, for all of us onward, that has been about a search for profitability, which is always the most exquisite when it includes the stolen wealth of others. Mm. So if we begin with that and proceed on, I think we can find much that will mobilize us collectively. Damn, I hate to come to a positive conclusion there. But <laughs> See, you, but, you um, thought you were not going to come to a positive conclusion, and here I you are. I will try and resist it, but here's, here's, our, um, here's our homework. Can we come together to save our world, our land, our territory, our water, all, all living things? the great Tanaka mandate of Akamas Kapi Kapsan, that we, come to, we have responsibilities to all living things, not just to ourselves, mm -hmm. not just to my history, but also to your history, yes. not just to human beings, but to the bees and to the caribou and to the frogs and to the bears and so on. I don't need to enumerate the entire <laughs> animal order <laughs> for you to understand that what I'm saying is the greatest political preoccupation of all of us must be this existential matter of survival or not in the face of corporate and political collaboration to, get lit to, to rid the world of us as quickly as they can. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a place to end. Thank you. Um, Oh, no, I was going to, well, you answered my last question without me even asking it, which was, what should we be doing together toward no, new modes of, of being together with us and all our relations? Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Let's... Thank you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Joyce Green, Gina Star Blanket, and Rinaldo Walcott, and our moderator, Christina Sharp, for challenging us so profoundly and for accepting our invitation to be here today. As I listen to you, I, I, I recognize that even the term reimaginings that is a part of this year's um, theme is itself fraught, right? Because it's not. For many of us, it's not an invitation into some kind of easy reassurance. For some of us, it's an opening into revolutionary thought and action. If we're really going to change the world, then something in this world needs to not only change, but break and yield. And all of us have to decide what that means for us. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and York University, a big thank you again to the Big Thinking sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, 
the Canada Foundation for Innovation, Universities Canada, and Sage Publishing. If you'd like to revisit the presentation, the video will be available on the Congress virtual platform um, in the coming days where you can view it until June 30. Today's lecture is a first of the Big Thinking events at Congress 2023. The second lecture, Seeds of the Future, Climate Justice, Racial Justice, and Indigenous Resurgence by filmmaker Alanis Abomsulin in conversation with Eve Tuck and Susan Blythe takes place tomorrow at the same time, 12.15 to 1.15 p.m. in this room or virtually. Please continue the conversation in your scholarly associations. If you are black, indigenous, um, or otherly racialized and need a space to gather, we have three spaces for you. One in the Center for Indigenous Student Services and the Center for Indigenous Knowledges and Languages in York Lanes, for black scholars in the Harriet Tubman Institute, and for black indigenous people of color scholars in the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean in the Kenneth Tower. Share your ideas on social media with the hashtag Congress, Congress with an H at the end. We're also inviting you to fill out a short survey um, using your mobile device. You can scan the QR code on the screen behind me. Thank you so much for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of your day and your remaining sessions at Congress. Merci, miigwech. Thank you.